Now let's have Dr. Michael uh, Laidlaw. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm uh, Dr. Michael Laidlaw. I'm a board certified uh, endocrinologist uh, practicing in private practice for the last 16 years uh, in uh, Rockland, California. Uh, trained at University of Southern California, primarily did internal medicine uh, residency and uh, fellowship at that location. Uh, I've been studying uh, and publishing uh, in this area for the last uh, five years, including uh, peer-reviewed journals such as uh, uh, Journal Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism and others. I also serve as an expert uh, witness on subject matter uh, in this area on a number of cases. I also have a patient who is a detransitioner. To start with some uh, definitions, uh, some of this has been gone over, but the gender identity is an internal feeling of being a boy or a girl or some variation. Gender dysphoria is a distress that arises from uh, an incongruence between that identity uh, and the physical body, leading to impairment. I think it's important to note that studies have shown that desistance or growing out of this condition uh, of children by adulthood is very high, some 50 to 98 percent. And these are studies done uh, primarily on 12 years old and younger. Now, as an endocrinologist, I treat, for example, uh, diabetes. I want to be sure before I give someone a very powerful hormone like insulin that they, in fact, have diabetes. I want to test to show that the glucose levels are high, or I could possibly injure or even kill the person. What about cancer? Before we give any powerful agents such as chemotherapeutics or surgeries, we certainly want to have physical evidence uh, of this problem, such as biopsies or imaging. Now, the gender affirmative therapy treatment proposed by WPATH and in place with WPATH gives very powerful hormones and surgeries. On what basis? Where can we find the gender identity to be certain that, that these children will not desist by adulthood? Can we use imaging of the brain or blood tests, uh, genetic testing? Are there other biomarkers to ensure that we are correct? There is no such thing. Starting with basic, just go back a bit to basic uh, biology. There are two human sexes, male and female. Males produce sperm. Females produce eggs. Uh, an embryo is conceived in such a process. When we move on to sexual development and differentiation uh, of the embryo, there are two pathways based on two ductal systems. The Wolfian ducts become male-associated uh, organs, such as epididymis, seminal vesicles. The malarian ducts develop into uh, fallopian tubes, uterus, portion of the vagina. It's important to note that this bifurcation or splitting down pathways occurs and one cannot switch from one pathway to the other. In other words, the actual ductal systems that produce these are destroyed in the process. And so this process is complete by around uh, 12 weeks uh, of embryologic development. Moving on to puberty, the next development in sexual maturity occurs during this time. The purpose of puberty is to achieve full adult sexual function and reproductive capacity. Uh, it's not optional. One cannot switch from one pathway to another. Uh, a testicle cannot be induced to produce eggs, and ovaries cannot be induced to produce sperm. I think it's important to note that uh, around what you see there, Tanner stage four or three, is when fertility is established. And so blocking puberty at Tanner stage two which is what's uh, advised by Endocrine Society WPATH, will necessarily lead to infertility, cross-sex hormones given over a long, prolonged period of time, may lead to sterility, and certainly surgeries to remove sex organs will ensure sterility. The basic problem with this treatment, as I see it, is what happens when you force a square peg into a round hole? You end up injuring or destroying the peg in the process. So what is gender affirmative therapy? There's really four stages, social transition, puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and then surgical modifications. What do we know about this? The, the biggest study uh, showing data over 30 years and looking at the entire medical databases of the entire population of Sweden 
found 324 individuals who had such hormones and surgeries and tracked them out. Here you can see uh, at around, this is showing uh, survival, and at around 10 years, the bottom two uh, dotted lines show a rapid uh, increase in mortality starting around uh, year 10, and you can see by the end, uh, the survival rate is much lower. They also found uh, increased risk of all-cause all -cause mortality of three times and inpatient psychiatric care. And there was 19 times completed suicide rate compared to the general population. Um, Dr. Biggs covered puberty blockers very well, and I just want to add a couple things. Here is showing normal uh, pituitary function where you have a signal sent out by the pituitary, in this case, to um, tell the testicles to make testosterone, or in the case of females, the ovaries to make estrogen. What happens when you give puberty blockers? You actually cause a medical condition that endocrinologists would try to treat. It's called hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. This is an iatrogenic uh, injury from this uh, type of treatment. And as you, to emphasize the idea, uh, from the guidelines is to stop at Tanner stage two. There will be no further pubertal development, even when giving cross-sex or opposite sex hormones. Just quickly, uh, here's a look at bone density, uh, the male and female over time. You can see where there's a rapid increase, should be a rapid increase in bone density. Uh, somewhere in the teen years, you can see the red and blue lines rising very quickly and increase in bone density. Then you can see the flat lining that I've shown which occurs with puberty blockers, which will lead to adulthood, lower bone density, potential for osteoporosis uh, and fractures. Moving on to uh, cross-sex hormones or opposite sex hormones. I want to give you an idea of, of how, what sort of doses we're talking about. Now I have here in blue is a normal uh, adult female testosterone range is somewhere uh, from 10 to 50. Conditions that we treat, which are caused called hyperandrogenism or high testosterone conditions, such as PCOS, uh, may have levels from 50 to 150. With endocrine tumors, such as with adrenal carcinoma, for example, uh, you may have much higher, 150 to 1,000, which is the, the red box you see there. And what are they advising in their guidelines uh, for females for transition? Uh, somewhere from 300 to 1,000, which is exceedingly high. If you calculate, it's about six to 100 times higher than endogenous female testosterone levels. What are the sorts of problems when giving high-dose hormones to males or females? Well, in both, you have an increased risk of myocardial infarction and death due to cardiovascular disease. You will also have sexual dysfunction and infertility. <coughs> Excuse me. Sticking with the... Uh, Female-born person uh, who's taking high doses of testosterone, uh, erythrocytosis or high red blood cell counts, severe liver dysfunction is a possibility, hypertension, increased risks of breast, ovarian cancer, um, hirsutism or permanent hair growth of the face, chest, abdomen, permanent deepening of the voice. How about male-bodied persons taking estrogen? There's a five times increased risk of thromboembolism or deadly blood clots, gallstones, high triglycerides, breast cancer risk has been shown to be increased 46 times above normal, gynecomastia or abnormal breast tissue growth, which if the person desists is a big problem as far as removal. Okay. I'd like to move on to um, surgeries. Uh, this is a, a person uh, born as a female who identifies as a trans male. This, you can see here evidence of the uh, hyperandrogen state uh, with uh, hair growth, uh, abdomen, and face. Now, the types of problems you can have with this surgery are significant scarring, 7 to 10 inches, um, problems with uh, normal nipple sensation. I think I read a study where one nipple fell off. It did not adhere afterwards. Difficulties with wound healing. What sort of ages are we talking about here uh, in the United States? You may hear that, uh, well, surgeries aren't done on kids, but here's a study published 2018 
uh, JAMA Pediatrics, I believe. You can see age groups. There's a couple of 13-year-olds who had mastectomy, what, five 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds. Very young ages. It's important. Uh, Dr. Uh, yes. uh, Dr. Layla, you have already surpassed your 10 minutes. Darn. Um, I appreciate your presence. So if we can wrap it up in the thir next 30 seconds, sure. 40, I really appreciate Let me it. Just jump to. I want to emphasize the Endocrine Society guidelines are written in 2017. Nine out of the 10 of these folks were all part of WPATH. WPATH is an activist advocacy organization. Um, in the disclaimer, it says very clearly, page 3895, that they do not establish a standard of care. This is not standard of care. There's already a community standard of care. All of the evidence is of low or very low quality or absent evidence. It's right there in their document. The WPATH has actually created standards of care hate and has removed all of the age minimums they had. They had a uh, 15 year old for mastectomy, uh, hysterectomy, orchiectomy, 17 years old. They've removed all these age restrictions uh, against the advice of their own experts. They've also uh, done a very poor job with grading the evidence. They've invalidated it. They have a chapter on how to make men into eunuchs. This is an extreme document. It presents a grave danger to minors. I would advise investigating uh, children with autism, depression, anxiety, help them with their psychological comorbidities, uh, psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, individual counseling, and family support. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Leila. Do the board members have any questions? Uh, you know, I have one question, Dr. Not a question, a comment. Yes. You, the person, you made a very good presentation. From what I understand, the complications and the the, the short term, the long term complications, I believe, are uh, irreversible and significant. Is that what I, your message was? Yes, I, I'm making the case that they they are well. Certainly, surgery is is irreversible. Removing uh, uh, testicles and ovaries is permanent sterilization. Um, some of these other problems will be permanent, like being on puberty blockers for a couple of years will cause permanent loss of bone density. Um, there's brain development, which occurs under the influence of sex hormones, which will be uh, altered permanently. Um, and other such effects, like I said, hirsutism, um, changes in voice will be permanent. Um, yeah, and infertility and such. But Sexual thank, dysfunction. Also. Thank you. Uh, board yeah. members? I hear from you that there's a 50 to 90% natural desistance rate. And I've seen that in the literature, but then we hear from Dr. Jansen that this identity cannot change. There's a clear conflict there. What are we to believe? Well, you can believe the studies. It's there in black and white. I, I have it. Um, I have references to, to look at. I mean, the, the reason why they're saying it's a permanent identity is because they are these, a lot of the studies doing now, the kids have already socially transitioned. They're on puberty blockers, which you heard there's very high rates of kids continuing on to cross sex hormones. So they're doing the interventions and then they're saying, look, they don't, they don't desist, but they've already, they've already undergone the treatments. So it's not a fair comparison in any way. And then we hear that the, you're saying the evidence is low quality endocrine society in their guidelines or their say it's low quality, but then we're hearing that the quality is the evidence quality is there. Again, we're hearing conflicting. What are we to believe? Well, if, if you look at quality of evidence, we're talking about, are there any randomized controlled studies that look at, let's take a group, two groups of kids with gender dysphoria. One, we give psychological support. The other, we give hormones and other therapies and compare those. The, those studies don't exist. Those would be called high quality studies. They don't exist. Um, even the NIH study that he referenced uh, doesn't do such a thing. So we don't have high quality evidence based on that. Any other board members? I have a question. Um, your Dr. Slide, Amy? Uh, your slide um, number 10 on the long term mortality um, with using cross sex hormones. What is the age of the transition of the participants that are being studied? Is it people who have been transitioned as youth or, or at all? The, these, yeah, here, here it is. These are, um, to my knowledge, all, well, they're adults. 
for the most part. Yeah, there is no such long-term study uh, for children. But one would predict, based on what's happening to adults, it would be similar for children or, or worse. Hearing no other questions from the board, uh, uh, Dr. Laidlo, thank you so much for thank coming from much. California and spending the time with us on such a very important matter. Now, appreciate it. Thank you. I really appreciate it.